Scooter McScoops here reporting for a hearty party of five and a half noon! There are only about 15 Leonardos known in the world. My friends, it's quite far-fetched to say you found a Leonardo. This is by far the most improbable story that's ever happened in the art world to date. The Salvador Monday found in an attic in New Orleans, originally purchased for a measly $1,100. Restored, revealed, reviled. After rigid technical and critical analysis, it was authenticated to be a real Leonardo. Sounds swell, right? Not so fast. Many still don't believe that it's a Leonardo, even though it was originally valued at $200 million. That's the bee's knees. The male Mona Lisa, a global celebrity, coveted by the richest people in the world. It's not just art history, it's world politics. Eventually sold for over $400 million. But, where is it now? Wow, it was so good to hear Scooter McScoop's voice again. It was. I was worried about him. I had no idea where he was. But apparently he's been crisscrossing the globe chasing this Leonardo story for us. Yes. On pretty much no budget from us. So I don't know how he's affording this. Zero dollars. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> we are a, we are a non-profit here that's right which that yeah. led us to go and investigate a little more the lost leonardo which we watched the documentary the lost leonardo which is on prime right now you can rent it or buy it right fascinating movie it is very fascinating and that led us to doug pattison he's a cia agent actually an ex -CIA. we find out well we find out that they're really not called agents oh do you want to know what they're called oh listen a little first <laughs> yeah <laughs> So he used to work for the CIA there you go. and he was a part of helping with that movie. Yes. Because he helped on the fraud side, the art fraud side. Yeah. So but he tells a whole bunch of other fascinating he stuff. He really does. If you love puzzles, <laughs> you're going to love listening to our interview with Doug Pattison. Please enjoy this. Doug Pattison, thank you so much for joining Hardy Party of Five and a Half podcast. We're talking to a real life CIA agent. I know. I feel like he could kill us if we say the wrong Probably thing. Probably at yeah. any time. So we but not on camera. That'd be bad. Okay, yeah. That would be bad. You have to have plausible denial. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, growing up, people want to be like FBI. It's Secret Service, CIA. Like, this is such a cool thing. How did you get into this? How did you decide you wanted to be a CIA agent? What? Well, it's kind of funny because it, it was sort of a fluke. Um, I So I had grown up and, and both my grandfathers were uh, in the military during World War II. And so so I kind of had grown up listening to them talk about stories of service and knew that I I wanted to do something like that, but wasn't really sure what form that might look like. And I explored a bunch of those. And without getting into all of that detail, ultimately still was kind of trying to figure it out. And I was on campus at uh, the University of Texas, where I was going to undergrad and going through the traditional job search process as you do. And the CIA was recruiting on campus. What? And you could, oh, wow. yeah, yeah, you could sign up for an interview to go interview with CIA. Lots of people would sign up on this list and you could go do it. But mostly what they were interviewing for was overt jobs, jobs where you can tell people you work for the CIA. They're looking for scientists and you know, and doctors and analysts and so on and so forth. Not, that was not their traditional path for pursuing clandestine jobs. And, we, and that means people who can't say where they work, who have some other job they tell people. And, but of course, I didn't know that at the time. This was pre-internet, so you had no real ability to research this stuff. And I had been, shall we say, a somewhat lackluster 
uh, student in college. I focused more <laughs> on beer and girls than I had my education. You but teach your party school. Yeah. So. That's right. Yeah. You can. Uh, but I was good with people. So yeah. I sat there with this recruiter and he looked at my resume and he's like, dude, I'm looking for engineers. I'm looking for scientists. Like, I'm not looking for guys that kind of have maybe, you know, if we stretch it, a B average um, and who are good with people. He goes, but that may qualify you to be a case officer. And I said, what's that? And he walked me through it. And I said, well, that's the only job I'd want to be in. It's, I don't want to be stuck behind a desk in, right. in Washington, D.C. And he said, well, I don't think you'll get through it, but um, we're going to, I'll put you forward for it. Um, we're going to have to send you a rejection letter because you signed up on this sheet um, that was publicly available. So we're going to publicly reject you from CIA, but we're going to put you in this other process, uh, clandestine process later, and just started from there. So what's that? Can you share what that process is like to go to the other side here to be the case? Sure. Um, it's funny because, you know, I didn't tell anybody about it. I didn't tell my parents, didn't tell my fraternity brothers, I, you know, didn't tell my roommates. I just started this process and I, I had to go to other cities and, and knock on hotel room doors and and open the door and get a, get interviewed by somebody in a hotel room and ask oh, wow. questions about all of the kind of your deepest, darkest secrets and psychological exams and physical exams and polygraph exams and um, just all this sort of stuff uh, to kind of get through each phase of this process. And all the while they're saying, okay, is this guy a good guy or a bad guy? Does he have the skill sets and capabilities we need to, to kind of get through this work? Uh, and should we keep pushing him through this, uh, this next phase? And, and much to my surprise, over time, I just kept moving forward <laughs> and, and, and made it through. I will say this though, at some point in time, you get far enough along that they do a background investigation on you. And that means they send uh, these other, you know, men and women in dark suits and, and sunglasses to go talk to bosses and neighbors and, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and they showed up at my fraternity house <laughs> and said that they want to interview my fraternity brothers about me. And those guys just couldn't pass up a good opportunity to mess with federal <laughs> investigators. Fortunately, the investigators were smart enough to kind of see through how this was going and not overly interpret uh, the truth of uh, my communist tendencies, my drug trafficking, <laughs> my uh, moonlighting as a gigolo, all of those oh, various God. things oh, that, my that my fraternity brother said I was doing. So. Oh, my word. <laughs> That's hilarious. Are you still friends with any of these guys? Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Did you ever have a chance to return the favor? Did they ever put, they probably smartly never put you down as a, you know, uh, referral on any of their job interviews. <laughs> Uh, well, we'll just put it this way. Not too many, uh, I think, fraternity guys from the University of Texas pursue paths that require security clearances. Okay. So okay. they yeah. generally don't have to worry about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you were a CIA case officer. So tell us what that job is like. And sure. yeah, just tell us what that's all about. So case officers are, or, are also called operations officers. And what case officers do, men and women both, go out and recruit and run assets to collect intelligence or recruit and run agents. So you mentioned earlier talking to a CIA agent. There really are no CIA agents, right? Employees oh. of the agency are called officers, mm -hmm. right? We're commissioned officers in, of, of various forms, um, but our treat are called officers. The assets we recruit are called agents. So we recruit and run oh, okay. agents. So a, an agent for the CIA is going to be a member of some other government or some other nation or some other business outside the United States who is providing secret information to us. And our job is to go out and recruit those sources, run them in order to collect information that ultimately the president needs to make decisions about policy that's important to the United States. Wow. Or we, we wanna use those assets to execute on the president's goals, or we wanna use those assets to stop people from doing bad things against us. So how do you go about, it's probably different in every situation, but what's kind of the best way to go about hiring a foreign agent? How do you- Asset. Asset, asset. yeah, sorry. Asset. Well, well they, either way, you can call them assets or agents. Yeah. I know, and so so we all get, we we get horribly offended and geek out on all the terminology. And, and <laughs> largely I recognize to most of the rest of the world, an agent is an officer, is an agent is an officer. It doesn't really matter. And and I get that, it's okay. Yeah. But-, but um, I guess how you, to answer your question, how you do that, 
is A, as you noted, dependent upon every specific case being different, but B is also the secret sauce of what it is we do. So finding the right ways to talk about that is a challenge sometimes because, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for my entire career inside CIA, I was a clandestine officer. I couldn't tell people what I did. I had a job that I told people what I did, and I legitimately did that job, but I had this whole other job that I did. And what we're required to do within CIA, even for the rest of our lives, is protect sources and methods. Sources being the names and and um, locations of the assets that we recruit and run, and methods being the ways we go about doing that. Mm-hmm. But there are some sources out there that have talked about it in the past. So I, I've got some ways to do that. But basically, it's a it's a matching of goals is maybe the best way to do it. Mm-hmm. I sometimes talk about it as it's the toughest sales job in the world because you're selling somebody on committing treason against their own nation at right, risk yeah. of death or imprisonment. Oh, so wow. you've yeah. got to find what are the right sales buttons to push in order to convince that person to take that risk for us and really work on our behalf. Wow. Oh, wow. So when you retire, so, you'll be a heck of a salesman. <laughs> right. There you go. So it's about building really tight relationships because there's a tremendous amount of trust that's yeah. involved. They're, they're counting on me to do whatever they can, whatever I can to keep them safe when I'm in that role. Because mm-hmm. the worst thing that'll happen to me for the most part is I might get arrested. I might get roughed up and thrown into jail overnight. But for the most part, I'm going to be put back on a plane and I'm going to be sent back home the next day or so because... That's kind of the rules of the game. And there are rules, like there's actually rules that, that both sides usually not always follow. And there've been some notable exceptions to it. But for the assets, for the folks that have been recruited to do this, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very real risk of lifelong imprisonment or even death, depending upon the nation. Yeah. And we have our own traders who have been recruited by the other side. Right, mm-hmm. Aldrich James being one recruited by the Russians, who will spend the rest of his life in supermax prison because he provided clandestine information to a foreign government. Hmm. Interesting. So the risk is real, and our job is to keep those assets safe. Yeah, that's yeah, crazy. That's yeah. so crazy. So, you, how did you become a rookie in Southeast Asia, and what did you learn there? Yeah, so um, it was interesting. I I wasn't sure where I wanted to go in the world, and and even now, in retrospect, I still am not sure I picked the right path. Um, but Southeast Asia was an area that always fascinated me. At the time I was going in, we actually hadn't been out of Vietnam all that long. Uh, so I had this really unique opportunity where my instructors were a mix of folks that actually had been members of the OSS in World War II, as well as members of MACV SOG in, in Vietnam. But it was at a time where we had no hot wars going on. So trying to figure out you know, what we were going to do, the targets we were going to go after and how we were going to go after them was, was a challenge. And counterterrorism was a fairly new field in, for us to pursue. Um, and many of the counterterrorist operations or organizations we were pursuing at the time were European-based, right? Things like the Red Army Faction uh, or the Bader meinhof Gang or 17 November, which weren't the traditional PLO, or now we think of, you know, ISIS or Al-Qaeda, those didn't really exist at those times. So, so counterterrorism was early. So what I did was I went down the counterterrorism path as an area of focus, but executing on it in uh, the Southeast Asia, where it was a, a fairly fast growing risk and threat to us. Uh, and so that began to pursue that path. But um, it was, it was neat for me because in, in the three tours, I did three overseas tours. Um, and in those three tours, I got to do three very different assignments. I got to do a counterterrorism tour. I got to do a kind of a, um, what we call a denied area tour, which is think of it as like trying to operate in Moscow. Mm-hmm. And then I got to do um, a classical big city tour where there, where all the targets were there. There weren't super high threats. Um, and it was kind of more like a a European style tour, but without being in Europe. And so I got to kind of experience the full breadth of those um, types of operations over those three tours. So is is a tour as long as it needs to be, or is there a certain time you're in and out? So as, as you'll know or learn quickly, the answer is almost always it depends Yeah. to almost all of these questions, right? Yeah. But in this case, it kind of depends on the job you're doing and the nature of of the assignment, how hard the assignment is. So the more difficult an assignment is, um, generally speaking, the shorter it might be. Meaning if it's a very um, 
austere living environment, uh, you may not be there as long. If it's a high threat environment, you're probably not going to be there as long. It's just very difficult to maintain the operational pace uh, in those places and, and stay healthy. Mm -hmm. um, but but there are other times where the language investment may be so intense mm -hmm. that they want to kind of get their their return on investment on that language. And so it may be a longer tour. So but yeah. roughly speaking, you know, two to four years is oh, fairly right. standard. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so can you tell us what your most dangerous op was, where you felt the most at risk? It's funny. It's not so much. Most of the operations, I I never really felt um, tremendously at risk. I mean, there there were some some silly ones, but you get trained pretty well. Where you feel often at higher risk is actually the incidental things that happen mm -hmm. in the environments you're in. Um, and I can think of. So I was returning from an operation one night in a high threat uh, post. So I was armed. Um, I was wearing body armor, you know, those sorts of things. And it was, I don't know, two in the morning or so. And I had, I had just finished a specific operational act and was on, on my way to spend some time to make sure that I was secure, not being followed, that sort of things. And it was where I was, was very quiet. There wasn't, there was very few folks around. Um, but I fairly shortly saw somebody walking towards me down this street in a not very nice area that was known for being a high threat area. And as this individual stepped into a spotlight in front of me, I saw that he had a weapon in his hand and he was um, bringing it up kind of, uh, almost to eye level as he stepped out of the spotlight about 40 meters from me. And so I immediately began to draw my weapon, anticipating that he was kind of bringing his weapon to bear on me when I continued to watch his motion. So I had my gun half drawn and his motion continued around and he went and tucked his weapon back in his holster stuck in the behind back oh. his back. And he hadn't actually ever seen me. Oh, wow. Right. And so, so was that, was, was it dangerous to me? Um, probably not. Had I shot him, it would have been both justified and wrong. Because yeah. the threat wasn't actually there, mm -hmm. but it would have looked like the threat was there. Right, and so for yeah. me, it was a great lesson in learning how how to ramp your response, but then mm -hmm. also how to de-escalate your response yeah. in these situations. Yeah. And it was just a completely incidental encounter that timing wise, you know, coincided with a, you know, the middle of a of a, an operation. Yeah, I think that ramping and de-escalating i mean in that amount of time that you have to make that decision i think that's the tricky part right it is yeah. and and by the way if you'd asked me if i could have done that i would have probably said no i, I no <laughs> like you, and and just it wasn't until you're in the midst of it did did you realize kind of what was what was happening so uh -huh. but I'll, I'll tell you maybe about my most stressful operation yeah right which is different than dangerous right okay. stresses can can be different we had um i had i'd recruited a source I'm trying to think what I can say without saying it. Well, I recruited a source that was going to be very difficult to ensure um, he wasn't working against us. Mm -hmm. And like so kind of thing. Huh? Like, like a, a double agent. agent. Yeah. 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 So we we decided we were going to take this person somewhere else to kind of go through a very robust process uh, to ensure that he was not a double agent uh, working against us. And so we'd set up all the things we had to do. And this was a, this was lots of money, lots of people involved, lots of planning and lots of days of execution. And we get to this place and have an initial meeting, set up a plan to meet later. And he disappears. Mm. He just disappears, which is not looking good for him not being a double agent, right? It's looking right. bad for that. Well, long story short, I spent three days looking for him in probably the seediest places that you can imagine yeah. before ultimately finding him still three sheets to the wind surrounded by uh, women of the night um, oh with goodness. the biggest smile you've ever seen on his face um, because wow. he had just spent three days on a bender taking yeah. advantage and dealing with his own stressors involved in, in all of this, yeah. but trying to figure out how do you do this? And it's, yeah. So that, that was messy and everybody's stress levels were super high. Oh gosh. Well, was he a double agent? 
<laughs> he can't say. Can't, can't say. Really okay. can't. Really can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, so, I know the answer, but I can't answer. Yeah. <laughs> right. For sure. It's implied. It's implied. Yeah. Um. So your wife Susan eventually joined the agency. What was her job? So my job was a case officer. Her job was what's called a staff operations officer. So basically, and we now call the role that she did a targeting officer, although we didn't really do have that that same title at the time. Um, but her job was to take information gathered by people like me and put puzzle pieces together mm -hmm. to figure out the puzzle. And she was focused completely on counterterrorism operations. And now we've all looked at, we've all done puzzles at home, jigsaw puzzles, where, you know, the first thing you do is you set the box up mm -hmm. and then you take all your, your, you know, hard edged pieces and you try to put together the outer edge of the puzzle and then move inwards. Right. Um, so imagine your puzzle where the box top is blank and okay. the pieces are blank mm -hmm. and the pieces only develop color as you put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. And so that was her job was to try and do that. And so um, she had got to do it at a very interesting time in the, in the agency's history. Uh, she was on the very first bin Laden team uh, oh, working yeah. on, on that target pre 9-11 Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so it was a, it was a very fascinating experience for her, but, but her job was not on the street, not meeting bad guys, whereas my job was. Yeah. So could you talk to each other, like full disclosure? Or um, gen I mean, so sort of, right. I mean, there's always barriers you have to find, um, because you need to know is actually still a very real, uh, aspect of it because the more people that know something, the, you know, higher the likelihood something escapes and. But right. you've heard the saying that the only way to keep a secret between two people is when one of them is dead. <laughs> um, and and so need to know is a principle. And and so if I really didn't have a need to know, she she generally wouldn't share that and and vice versa. But oftentimes because of of working together and working abroad together, we would have that need to know and and would, you know, include her in things. Yeah. So are you are y'all both good at handling stress? This all this seems like high stress stuff. So, are y'all? Did you develop ways to handle stress? And did y'all? Did it affect your marriage at all? Living in such a stressful job? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a great question. Uh, you know, my ability to handle stress, I think, is probably pretty high. You know, people at work ask me today because I'm I'm obviously out now. People at work say, "Why isn't this stressing you out?" And my response, and I realize this is probably overly flippant a response is because nobody's going to die today if I screw up and nobody's trying to kill me. And there was a period <laughs> of time in my life where I couldn't say those two sentences mm -hmm. and therefore it's, it's just noise. But then I realized in saying that to a lot of other people, that's kind of dismissive of their stresses. And I need to recalibrate mm -hmm. for myself that it just means I need to learn how to, to <laughs> understand people better. Yeah. But my kids may tell you that my ability to handle stress is probably not as good <laughs> as I might think it is. Yeah. Right? And so I, you know, it's, it's, we're all on a continuum working through it, but it, it becomes really important to learn how to do that. Right. And um, I think even the community has gotten real, gotten a lot better about helping with that, but it's still, it's still difficult. And we, we see it most directly on the military side of, of things where they talk about PTSD. And now you can talk about that. Whereas even 15 years ago, you really, really couldn't talk about it a lot without people going, oh, come on, you just gotta, you know, buckle down and, and push through. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it comes at a real cost in largely two marriages. I think, um, mm -hmm. if I were to describe why we left, it's because we chose to stay married over staying in. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. and, and very few first marriages survive a career inside CIA. Wow. It's not always the case, and but, but more so in the operations side than anywhere else. And, and some of it can be just because the stressors are too high. Some of it can be the separation can be too much, too long. Mm -hmm. Some of it can be the temptations are just too high. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, I watched a lot of people make bad decisions because they could just tell their spouse, hey, I got to go out for the next uh, eight hours and I can't tell you where I'm going or why. Right. And, and that's largely true, mm -hmm. but that's also becomes very easy to abuse. All right. For sure. How long have you been married? Uh, 30 years this year. Oh, oh wow, we are too. Team. Congratulations. <laughs> Actually, it'll be 31 in October for us. So it'll be oh, 31 awesome. October. We were 30 in well uh, this month. August. Yeah, earlier this month. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's Cong great. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we just decided we wanted to stay married longer, um, uh, more <laughs> yeah. more than we wanted to be in. Yeah. And, uh, one or the other. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Yeah. Now it's interesting. Our, you know, our oldest ended up joining as well and serving in CIA for a few years before he moved on to go do other things too. Hmm. That's cool. Okay. So, um, I was fascinated by a movie I saw. I was on a plane going somewhere and I saw this movie called The Lost Leonardo. <laughs> yeah. And I wanted to talk to you about that because it's fascinated me because I'm kind of an art history buff and all that. So the whole story has fascinated me since I saw the movie. And he can't so, get anybody to answer any questions. Yeah, about I'm it. starting to wonder what's going on here because <laughs> I've contacted other people and nobody wants to talk about it. Like even the director of the movie is like, well, I don't know. I've, I've talked a lot about this. I don't really want to talk about it anymore. So we need to know what's going on here. So, <laughs> so for the audience, tell us what The Lost Leonardo is about and how you got involved in all that. Sure. Uh, so The Lost Leonardo is about a painting, painting that was discovered now about 20 years ago in New Orleans. Um, and it, the painting was a painting of Christ um, holding the, the world in his hands uh, that had been known to have been a painting that, that Leonardo da Vinci painted called the Salvatore Mundi, but had long been thought lost to history. And so the, the movie tells the story about the painting's discovery, its restoration, and ultimately the, the debate, discovery and or debate about whether it was actually this missing Leonardo da Vinci painting. But, but really it tells a story about geopolitics, about greed, yeah. about um, you know fraud, money, um, all sorts of things on that. And um, so it's a pretty fascinating story. It's got lots of human drama in it, a lot of international intrigue. So it's really a lot of fun to, to see the story. Um, I got involved with it um, be, through friends. I, so I started probably seven years ago now working on film and TV projects as a consultant and a producer focused primarily on intelligence and special operations themed projects. And so when they first began to look at this, they said, well, because of the Saudi involvement, because of the use of some kind of international money laundering tools that are involved, we really want some folks who, are, who understand how that world works and asked me if I'd be willing to come on and, and talk about it and help them understand how that world works and operates. Hmm. Okay. So it's been a ton of fun. Yeah, and, and it's really fun to work on those projects. That was really, uh, most of the projects I work on are typically fictional, mm -hmm. um, you know, so so creative enterprises, whether for film or TV. This was the first um, documentary that I had worked on. And it was interesting because I did not work closely with the with the Saudis or, or the Omanis in, uh, in over my career. But most of the folks who did wouldn't ever actually talk about them because they're, you know, they don't want to put things at risk. And so w one of the things I got to do is serve in that role where I could um, be an intermediary between the worlds. Because the Saudi prince ended up buying the painting, right? Oh. Yeah, which is pretty fascinating, right? So uh -huh. a painting of Christ bought by the, the, the putative leader of the Muslim world, right? Yeah. Um, who's not supposed to own graven images because in Islam, you're not supposed to own a picture, you're not, you're not supposed to own pictures of prophets. Right. right. And that's or make them or anything like that. Um, and lots of questions about, well, whose money did he use? And he didn't actually buy it directly. He bought it through the through um, the Emiratis, you know. And again, was he using kingdom money? Was he using personal money you know, before his dad became the king? They had no money. They were broke. So yeah. how did they all of a sudden be, become able to in one year buy a four hundred and fifty million dollar painting and a four hundred and fifty million dollar yacht? Right. All in the same year and a million and a billion dollar French villa, like <laughs> while while encouraging his own people in Saudi Arabia to pursue austerity measures. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So what do you think? Wh what do you think the reason was he would buy the painting then? Is there any? Oh, anybody, yeah. What's the point of buying it? Um, mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, is this a family podcast or can we swear? No, it's family. <laughs> yeah. OK. <laughs> um, well, that's why that's why I ask. Um, it's a measuring contest, right? Uh, a global oh, measuring see. contest, oh, okay. right? So, so some yeah. people keep score based on trophies, right? Uh -huh. And this this is this is a trophy. Mm, huh. Okay. So now it it's a controversial trophy because is yeah. it real or is it not? I mean, there's there's only fifteen Leonardo da Vinci paintings worldwide that are known to to exist. So. Yeah. Obviously, if you have one of those and, you know, then then you've got a legitimate 
kind of worldwide trophy. But but if it's not real, all of a sudden, is it a trophy? Yeah. Yeah, which makes you think, okay, I'm going to lock this away now because it's going to embarrass me because it's not real. Because it was fans of New Orleans, right? So they couldn't, part of, I, from the movie, part of the reasoning that they're not, some people aren't buying that it's Leonardo's because you couldn't really follow the ownership of the painting, right? To figure out. Well, how, I, how think, I think at, at the end of the day, I think the reason it's difficult for folks to follow it is not because it wasn't a Leonardo painting, but because they couldn't conclusively prove that he was the sole painter, yeah. right? I, I think at the end of the day, I think they were fine that um, that he painted some of it, hmm. right? But did he paint all of it, or did other students in his studio paint it? Was it a stu what they call a studio painting, or was it by the master's hand? Yeah, right? I, I actually think all of the experts agree that he painted on that board, but there's some questions about why he chose that board, or did you know so. They talk about the knot in the wood, and he wouldn't choose an imperfect, you know, piece of wood for the for a perfect painting of Christ, et cetera. But you know, could somebody else have chosen it? And then he helped that student fix that painting, or you know, those sorts of things. It's so there's a, there's ambiguity there, less about the ownership, in my opinion, and more yeah. about can you confirm that he did the whole thing? And that ambiguity then becomes heightened by the restoration process that happened, mm -hmm. and what does that mean? Yeah, he's mm. he's much more the art history person. But my question is like, does he have other paintings where he let other people paint on them? Yeah, they all he does. So that oh, would yeah. be that would be like a. Weird it brings painting. down the value a lot. Then it does. I mean, it's still a. It would still make it a tens of millions of dollar painting. But but the, there's a big difference between a fifty million dollar painting and a four hundred fifty million dollar painting. Yeah. Right. And and so it it's it was not uncommon for a grandmaster, whatever they call them in the art world, I don't know. Um, but but somebody, you know, a master to paint a painting where he paints a large chunk of it, but his students finish it. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, these were still business people, right? Leonardo da Vinci ran a painting studio that sold paintings to other people. And so, I mean, what's wrong with getting a little help from your students who are really good and and can... You know, they can fill in over here they can touch up around here mm -hmm. and you're still selling you know that painting is still being sold because you know did he know it was going to be one of 15 masterworks by him you know did it matter yeah uh, who knows it's a he was just selling a painting yeah he was trying to probably crank out more paintings to make more money to be right. more yeah right so really and good. and could he do that in a way that didn't sacrifice the art because i don't want to diminish his desire as an artist to to create, mm -hmm. but you know it, it's it, he was still trying to sell paintings. It's fascinating hmm. that they can decipher whose hand, what yeah, hand stroke is yeah, whose. You know, yeah. like yeah, and um, that's completely beyond my my skill set. <laughs> you know, background knowledge, whatever. I was you know I was in awe of that piece of it. I just I could talk about you know the fraud piece, the money piece, and how stuff moves around the world and and those sorts of things. Yeah, is there. Speaking of the money part, there's probably a lot more of that going on than we realize, right? Like, oh yeah, absolutely, all the time. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, so I don't know. There, there's some interesting images out there that you can look up where you can see how much space a million dollars takes up, right? And so imagine if if a million dollars fits on. Well, you know, we flew three million dollars into um, Afghanistan right after 9-11 to start paying, um, you know, the, the Northern Alliance to help us go find bin Laden. And those $3 million went in on literal pallets, right? So take that and now imagine a $450 million. And so if you can move $450 million in an 11 by 16 painting yeah versus moving 450 million dollars in, in cash and yeah. by the way 450 million dollars that may be disguised as a uh, velvet painting of elvis playing poker with dogs right mm -hmm. like uh, <laughs> how how much easier is it to commit securities fraud money laundering right. those sorts yeah. of things by moving money those ways and so yeah absolutely it happens a lot it's just a different kind of debit card right i mean <laughs> you, you see it in certain parts of the world where uh, I'll say oligarchs without naming the country they're from um, might buy it, build a building, never have it occupied, and then sell it at a loss in order to have that sales proceeds go into a bank account and now be legitimized as coming from the sale of a building 
and the cost of the laundering it is the loss on the building. Wow. <laughs> but now it's clean money. Yeah. So yeah, that stuff happens a lot and it happens with buildings, it happens with art, it happens with jewelry. Wow. Planes, boats, all that sort of stuff. Oh my goodness. And here we are just sitting here with well, one house. We gotta think of something, yeah. <laughs> what can we think of? I don't know. Uh, no. I'm probably I'll probably get arrested pretty quick. Yeah, you probably even. would. Yeah, yeah. I will say this. Um uh, yeah, you you want to avoid prison at all costs. <laughs> yeah, I'm I think so. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely a goal in life for us for sure. <laughs> so are you where do you think that the painting is now? Yeah, where is it? I I I think it's on MBS's yacht. Oh that wow. that is the last place that people I know that I spoke to said that they saw it. Because it was supposed to go to, he wanted to, didn't he want it in the Louvre next to the Mona Lisa? Like, yeah, so so there's some theories. So originally it was going to be in the Louvre at the Leonardo da Vinci exhibit. And then they were going to give it equal pairing with the right. Mona Lisa. And they were going to call it the male Mona Lisa. Or they, or they have already tried to call it that. But then um, it was going to be attributed to as opposed to by. So it was going to... In that in that exhibition, it would be not treated the same as mm -hmm. if he had painted it. And so that would immediately devalue the painting. So he pulled the painting from that exhibition. And then there was also talk that he was going to put it in what's called the Abu Dhabi Louvre. So in um, the UAE next door to Saudi Arabia ish, um, there's a, a Middle Eastern Louvre that's been built. And there was talk about putting it there. But mm -hmm. I think at this point in time, given the, the difficulties of agreeing on its um, genuineness, it, it's not going to put it on display anywhere. Yeah. So it's a $450 million painting on the $450 million yacht, probably. Correct. Yeah. Hmm. How old was he when he started painting these pictures? Who, Da Vinci? Yeah. Oh, I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, no. No, no, no. I'm I not close. There's still time for you. Yeah. I feel well, like. there's still time. Yeah. I could do a master <laughs> yeah. work. Yes. You, we could be talking about me. I mean, years. we're trying to figure out like what you should like do. Like 500 years later. Yeah. Can we talk about <laughs> yeah. works here? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you're in, moving on. Your Instagram name is Texas Spy Dad. We we talked a little bit previously about you don't live in Texas anymore, but you clearly love Texas. So what do you love so much about Texas? I, I guess it's, it's just where I grew up. So it, it will always be home. You know, my my family moved to Texas in 1832. Um, you know, so, so it was part of Mexico at that point in time. And it just, it's unlike anywhere else in the world. And, you know, most, most Texans claim that I think, um, and you know, my, my family is still there. So I just, I just love it. I love the history. Yeah. I love what, it, what it has stood for in its own history, as well as our nation's history. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that mix of old West meets South has always been kind of a, a neat aspect of it, um, for me. So it's just, it's just home no matter where I, where I live. And, you know, when my kids were being born in various places around the world, we always had a bag of dirt from Texas oh, under really? the delivery table in the operating room so that my kids could be born over Texas. So oh, that Texas is awesome. Dirt. That is cool. Yep. And what? so that, and that bag of dirt ended up getting passed around to other Texan expats in various places around the world so that their kids too could be born over Texas soil. <laughs> That is fantastic. I love that. That is I awesome. I love it. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, you've got to leave us with some, some Texas wisdom then. You have a uh, something you call the rule of stupids. So tell us sure. what that's about. It's not very kind, but uh, it, what it, it, so years ago, I started talking to my kids about trying to be more aware. And, and I teach and talk a lot about security topics, specifically focusing on situational awareness. And, you know, a, a very common one that we all kind of joke about is you don't have to outrun the bear. You just got to outrun your buddy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I just was trying to think of things that would be more useful for them that, that they could remember. And one of the ones that I came up with was the rule of the stupids. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's simply this. Don't do stupid stuff with stupid people <laughs> in stupid places <laughs> at stupid times. And, and what I mean by that is um, you could argue that going off a rope swing at a rock quarry or in a river is a riskier than average endeavor. 
but it's probably in the bounds of normal risk or taking a jump on your BMX bike or, or whatever, those sorts of things, you know, you, you want to teach your kids how to assess and take risks. So, but you could, people would call that stupid. Yeah. Potentially, but doing it um, with friends that are known to be heavily peer pressure oriented people known to tell you to go higher than you feel comfortable with known to maybe uh, add alcohol into the mix and then want to go do it in the quarry um, that's known to have submerged rocks and do it at night. Like all of a sudden adding a viol each of those violations of the rule of stupids increases risk of a bad thing or a catastrophic thing happening mm -hmm. exponentially. Mm -hmm. And so what we began to do is just talk about that and talk use that as a mnemonic for assessing risk. And it could be, hey, this neighborhood is a totally safe place to walk through at 2 p.m., but it's a totally unsafe place to walk through after 2 a.m. while drunk from being out with their friends and now doing it solo, right? right? And, you know, assessing, you know, somebody would bluster in a bar or all those sorts of things. And you can get away generally with violating one, maybe two of the rules of stupids. Mm -hmm. But if you violate all four, pretty certain something bad is going to happen. Yeah. And so it just became the way we talked about it with our with our kids for risk assessment. <laughs> I like No, that. I love that. And it's using your job, the things you've learned in your job to to help teach your kids. That's awesome. Yeah. And and by the way, I think it helps adults as well as oh, children. Yeah. And, and and so, you know, in in our world, our like the initial security assessment tool that I was taught was get off the X, right? If X being the spot where the bad thing has happened, your first thing to do is get off the X and 95% of the time. The bad thing stops happening, yeah. right? But if the bad thing follows you to a new X, then you've got to start doing things. Well, I realized that an even better thing was avoiding the X to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so trying to figure out how to avoid the X, how to look for the X before most other people see it became the driver for the rule of the stupids. Oh, I love it. Because those things are in our control. Mm -hmm. You need to have that little saying though on a coffee cup, you know. Right. Put in all your kids the rule of stupids yeah. and then put it yeah in that oh, needs yeah. to be right. that needs to be out there for sure and it was it was fun no, my, my daughter's what's that <laughs> that would sell in texas <laughs> it probably would my daughters uh, were on a podcast where they got asked about kind of how they approach stuff and and the premise of the podcast was working through the tv show taken or the movie taken yeah. right with liam neeson mm -hmm. and so the podcast was like well wait a second i've got a real cia dad and i've got you know daughters <laughs> Let's talk to them about what they think about this movie, right? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it was, so it was gratifying for me because my daughters were able to talk about how they've applied the rule of stupids over time and what it's meant for them in terms of assessing risk with their friends and, and others, both domestically and international. Yeah, and what they've been protected from that they probably don't even realize. Right, like none cases. of us know. There's probably a lot right. of protected us from that we don't know. Yeah, for sure. So. Well, I always tell people it's not the shark you see you need to worry about. That's, that's right. The truth. That's yeah. exactly right. We have, let me tell you, ask you if this is smart or not. We have a plan. Scott is the fastest human that I know at 52 years old. Like nobody wants to run the bases in front of behind him when we are in front of him, when we play softball together, none of that. I'm much nastier of a fighter. <laughs> so I tell him if we ever get in a situation, I know you would want to stay and fight, but you have to run. Cause if I'm running I gotta nobody, run, get a help. You nobody's getting saved because I am so slow, but yeah. I'll stay and fight and you run. This sound, yeah, yeah I, and I will say this. I will always take the nastier fighter <laughs> on my side because somebody who's willing to fight, like they got nothing to lose. Yeah. That's that can be valuable in those situations. That's who you want on your team. All right. So now I'll run get help while y'all fight. That's right. That's all right. Okay. That's the that plan. sounds great. Hey, I just wanna I wanna thank you and congratulate y'all for just deciding to choose your marriage mm -hmm. and thank you, you know, cool. getting out of the work that was stressing y'all. And I just I just want to encourage y'all on that because that's pretty cool. Not yeah. everybody does that. So. Yeah, for sure. thank you. Yeah. We, you know, we we love that period in our lives. We're proud of what we got to do, and we're proud of the work we got to do. And we wouldn't have changed that for the world, but also it became time that we needed to choose a different path, and um, and that just was that was really important to us that that we did that. So thank you for the encouragement. Yeah. That's cool. Well, I feel like I'm pretty good at puzzles and you're pretty good at painting. So we've got some work to do. I think that maybe okay. we've got different careers we need to focus yeah. on. It might be a little <laughs> long on the tooth to start, but yeah, maybe so. <laughs> like you need to be a younger person for this kind of job. Maybe. It, it it typically is a younger person's uh, younger person's job. Shame. That's a shame because there's so much wisdom in age, right, Doug? There is. There, there is. <laughs> the youth is wasted on the young. 
Yeah, that's right. That's sure right. Is. Well, we thank you so much, Doug Pattison. Like we, I've learned so much. I think this is a cool little inside. You probably didn't give us anything but the tip of the iceberg on what you do, <laughs> but we, it was more than what we knew. So we appreciate you taking time with us today, giving us all the insight, teaching us the rule of stupids, because I will take that with me and I will teach my kids that as soon good. as we're doing this podcast. <laughs> well, yeah. well, good. I mean, look, we, I, we need good people to go out and do these types of jobs. They're hard jobs that require people to make hard choices. Um, we need people to start learning hard languages to help us, you know, kind of accomplish our goals. So I'm thrilled to be able to get on on shows like yours and, and talk about it and maybe spark an interest in somebody yeah. that um, will, will lead to them desiring to serve and go yeah. step up and do that hard thing in a hard place. Yeah. So I'm happy to do it. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, you, thank sir. you. And thank you for serving. We appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank Thanks, you guys. Take Have care, a good day, Doug. All right. Bye. 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 So, Rebecca, mm. are you down with this? I'm so down. Are you ready to become CIA so officers? Case officers? Case officers. Yes, we're not agents. The no. agents are the ones that we hire to go against their country and everything they believe in. I want to do that. <laughs> what kind of salesman can do that? I don't even understand how you do that job. I don't actually think I'd be good at that. I am I can sell people on a hairstyle, but I can't sell them. <laughs> I could draw a picture for them. I don't think I could tell them to go against everything they believe. That's a big job, but yeah. we're glad somebody out there does it. So That's we right. hope you enjoyed this interview with Doug Madison as much as we did, because we thought he was a really cool down to earth guy. Like I thought we needed to be like careful what we say. And I mean, he did have to tiptoe around some things. He did. He had to figure out a way to say a few things there. That was interesting. So I know. I know. That but, could lead to our another podcast. Like, But he also helped us with the Lost Leonardo. It's basically <laughs> on the Saudi prince's yacht. So we know where it's at now. Basically. We got the scoop. Signed, sealed, and delivered. That's right. We solved this case. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed. Case closed. That's right. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed this interview with Doug Pattison and from Hardy Party Five and a Half, over and out. We'll see you next time, I hope.